Good morning and welcome to a virtual lesson on Samson. If you're at home, for those in the congregation, we welcome you. The people in the congregation are going to have an integral part in the closing because the closing Laura will pull up about five or six screens with questions. And I would really like for those of you in the audience to give your answer. And what I'll do for the folks at home, repeat the answer, paraphrase it. But um, let's pray before we start. Lord, we take a look now at uh, Samson. He gets four chapters in the book of Judges. Help us to take a look at his life. And we might learn something about his life as judge, his life as warrior, his life as an individual, um, and learn something also about his, uh, about his death that we can apply to our life. In Jesus' name, amen. So we have a title. A miracle birth, a miracle birth, but a man of great physical strength, but also a man of great moral strength weakness. And so we're going to take a look at this. He's a miracle baby, which we will read about in the, in the chapter. He was chosen by God to lead Israel. He was blessed by God. He was shaped by God. He was empowered by the Holy Spirit. One commentator said Samson is the last great hope for Israel. Kind of scary, right? This guy who takes four chapters is the last great hope for for Israel. So what's he going to do? What's he going to do? What will he be like? What are his good points? What are his bad points? His name, by the way, means little son, S-U-N, little son, which means because of the tribe of Dan, where he came from, and we'll take a look at this in just a minute, they are bordered by the Philistines in Canaan, which of course practiced all kinds of fake worship, idol worship. So that idea of his name being little son might be a little bit of transference from the Philistines who were his neighbors. Neighbors. Problem is, throughout the book of Judges, Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Six times, six times that's mentioned in the book of Judges. This is the last time. So we're going to take a look at photo number one that Laura is going to bring up. Samson, the last appointed judge by God. And we're going to see his flaws. Tim Keller says that um, the flaws that we're going to see was throughout the book of Judges. And as a result, we may be able to see these flaws in us. So he, Keller says the last God appointed judge, we see the flaws of God's people between the time of Joshua and the monarchy. Might some of his flaws be like ours as well? Sin, disobedience, self-centeredness. This evil was done in the eyes of God, but was it seen in the eyes of those who did it? I think that's a good question. I wish it were mine. It was Keller's. God saw it. How many times in the books of Judges have we said they did evil, they did evil? I wonder if the people realize they did evil. Did they see it in themselves? Do I see it in myself? Okay? So, photo two. Do I rationalize my sin by using my own definition of sin and not using God's definition of sin? Does sin deceive me and cause me to break fellowship with God. And those of you in the sanctuary, does sin deceive me and cause me to break fellowship with God? Your answer is? Yes. Yeah, it does. Amen, right? Amen, a woman. Okay? So, let's read the first five verses. First five verses of Judges, um, chapter 13, the birth of Samson. Now, before we do that, if you take a look at Judges, chapter 12, the last six verses you get those minor prophets. And we talked about them last week. Those three minor prophets in Judges 12 will give Israel 25 years of peace. 25 years of peace, moral leadership, good guidance by men we think of high moral character. 25 years, all three die. And we made it a point last week that in the last sections there of chapter 12, we know where each one was buried. Notice how 13 starts off. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. 25 years of peace and moral leadership 
The last judge dies. Again, the Israelites did evil in the eyes of the Lord. So the Lord delivered them into the hands of the Philistines for 40 years. Now, let me ask you a question. I don't have an answer, okay? Do you think that 40 years was just a circumstantial number? Just in happenstance? Is there anything connecting religious, biblical about 40 years? In the wilderness for... 40 days, but that's okay. 40, 40 days. Noah and the ark, Noah and the ark 40 days and 40 nights. Uh, the exodus was for 40 years. Yeah, I, I, I think God has a sense of humor. That 40 plays out throughout Scripture. Okay, verse 2. A certain man of Zora named Manoah. So we know Samson's dad's name. We do not find out the name of his mother, but she's a key figure in this story. Okay, a certain man of Zorah named Manoah from the clan of the Danites had a wife who was childless, unable to give birth. The angel of the Lord appeared to her and said, you are barren and childless, but you're going to become pregnant and give birth to a son. Does that sound familiar? Is there going to be a story maybe later on? Okay. Now see to it, he's talking to the, to the mother, future mother, that you drink no wine or other fermented drink, and that you do not eat anything unclean. You'll become pregnant and have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor because the boy is to be a Nazarite. And we'll take a look at that in just a minute. Dedicated to God from the womb. Every judge that we have talked about for the last few weeks was called by God. This one is called by God before he was ever born. Kind of unique, right? Maybe that's why he's the last judge, okay? He will take the lead in delivering Israel from the hands of the Philistines. The reason why Samson is going to be born, he's going to free the Philistines. And for those of you who love to read ahead, I know where I'm going. First time in a long time. Next week's chapter 14. His marriage. He's going to marry a Philistine chicky baby. He's going to marry a Philistine girl. Why in the world would a Jewish judge, called by God from the womb, marry a woman from Philistine? It's in chapter 14. Well, she was cute. You know, I think she was probably cute because the minute he saw her, he told his dad, Man, I love her. Go get her. Get her, dad. There was a reason. And it's, it's in chapter 14. Okay, so I hope, I hope you'll do that. Okay, so again, Israel did evil in the eyes of the Lord. Delivered them in the hands for 40 years. Sin has its consequences. The tribe of Dan had a problem. When you go back and read Joshua, and you take a look at maps in your Bible commentary, Dan was given probably the least amount of land. A small amount in terms of square foot. Bordered... Philistine, just like if you, if you get from our house on I-20 and you go about six miles outside of uh, Bremen, you're in Alabama. The, the tribe of Dan bordered the Philistines, and the tribe of Dan did not conquer everybody in that territory. The Danites were weak. So I think it's safe to conclude Samson may have come from a tribe that in terms of military powers was very weak. Now, why is this important? In Genesis chapter 12, verse 7, Genesis 12, 7, God gave the land of Canaan as a gift to whom? Israel. This is a gift. Go get it, Abraham. So he did. And in Genesis chapter 12, verse 2, God told Abraham, you're going to be a great, great nation. So great, when you look at the stars, you can't even begin to count the people will be fathered by you and your sons. It's going to be a great, great nation. And your followers will be set apart. We're going to have a special covenant. That's going to happen when they get there. The problem, and this is the first time I've really de developed the second part of the problem. The problem throughout the book of Judges so far is that there has been military battles. Every one of those judges, including the female judge, what was her name? Deborah, 
were military commanders. There's been a battle that all of these judges have fought. Some bigger battles, some smaller battles. Physical battles, hand-to-hand -hand combat, swords, spears, chariots. There's another battle going on that now I can mention for the first time in this study. Physical battle, spiritual battle. Satan does not want Canaan to become a Jewish nation. Satan does not want those 12 tribes to be successful. Satan does not want Jehovah to be worshipped. Satan doesn't even want a tabernacle or Moses' commandments or the first five books. It's a spiritual battle and Satan will use the following tools. Idol worship, fake gods, multiple gods, temple prostitutes who would lure the men into the temple, baby sacrifice to the idol Molech. Those were his tools in battle. So what did Israel do? Israel did We just read, they did evil. Israel did evil. So now we're going to take a look at a map, because I've, I've mentioned this before. We're going to take a look at, at a map of Philistine and Dan. Now, if you'll take and start up at Asher, Naphtali, Zebulun, Manasseh, remember, two half tribes, one half tribe on the east of the Jordan, one half tribe on the west of the Jordan. If you'll keep coming down, Ephraim, Gad, Reuben, Judah, Simeon, there you'll see the Philistine area and you'll see that little tiny area of Dan. They border. And this is where Samson is going to grow up. And the other thing that I would like to repeat is, again, go way up at the beginning. Armenians, come on down, Ammon, Moab, Edom, Amalek, Philistine. Those are those heathen tribes that surrounded the land of Canaan. So that's why it was so important when Joshua gave out the tribal lands, they go in there and they conquer and they establish their borders. So in verses 2 and 3, here's what we learn. Manoah is married. We don't know his wife's name, and she is unable to have a baby. They're childless. An angel appears to her saying, you're going to have a son, and your son is going to be a Nazarite from birth. Now, he didn't say this. But you know what the angel could have said, what he could have said, with God, comma, with God, comma, nothing is impossible. Nothing is impossible. You agree with that? Okay. With God, nothing is impossible. Other gods were raised up by, other judges were raised up by God. This one will be raised up in the womb. So let's take a look at the Nazarite vow. I think she's going to pull up numbers. There we go. That's a great read. Sometime this afternoon before you take your nap. There are some folks in the sanctuary. We got hands going up. Yeah, read Numbers chapter 6 about the Nazareth vow. No wine. No fermented drink. No grape juice. No raisins. Could not find out why they couldn't eat raisins. Had to be a reason. No grapes. No seeds or skins. No haircut. Avoid dead bodies even if your family member dies. Because if you touch that body, if you get close to that dead body, your mom or dad, sister or brother, you're unclean. Keep that in mind. When Samson kills the lion, goes back a few days later, and there's honey, and he picks it up, mm, this is pretty good, he takes it to his mom and dad. Everybody that got that honey were ceremonial unclean. Samson should have known better. But how many times do we know better and we still go ahead? Okay? So that's just a brief look at the Nazareth vow. More of it is in Numbers chapter 6. Now his mother, as we've read, was obligated to fulfill that vow, vow while she was pregnant. No raisins, no grapes, no haircut, no wine, and so on and so forth. Okay? So she's going to get pregnant. We pick up now in verse 6. So if you've got your Bible... Uh, pick up with me, please, in verse 6. Then, after she was told by the angel, the woman went to her husband and told him, A man of God came to me. A man of God came to me. An angel? Jesus? He looked like an angel of God. Very awesome. 
I didn't ask him where he came from, and he didn't tell me his name. But he said to me, you'll become pregnant and have a son. Now then, drink no wine or other fermented drink, and do not eat anything unclean, because the boy will be a Nazareth of God from the womb until the day of his death. Then Manoah, the husband, prayed to God, Pardon your servant, Lord. I beg you to let the man of God you sent to us come again to teach us how to bring up the boy who is to be born. Is that a legitimate prayer by the father-to-be? Oh, and God, please send your angel again. I wasn't there the first time. I need to have some parenting skills. Legitimate? Okay, sure. All right. God heard Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman while she was out in the field, <laughs> but her husband Manoah was not with her. Hmm. The woman hurried to tell her husband, he's here, he's here, the man who appeared to me the other day. Manoah got up and followed his wife. When he came to the man, he said, are you the man who talked to my wife? I am, he said. So Manoah asked him, when your words are fulfilled, what is to be the rule that governs the boy's life and work? What is to be the set of rules, the obligations, the policies? What's all those things we're supposed to do to rear this kid? The angel of the Lord answered, Your wife must do all that I've told her. She must not eat anything that comes from the grapevine, nor drink any wine or other fermented drink, nor eat anything unclean. She must do everything I have commanded her. Did the angel change any parental instructions? No, he did not. Manoah said to the angel, Would you like to stay until we have lunch? That's what he's saying. I got some goats. Would you stay for lunch? The angel of the Lord replied, Even though you detain me, I will not eat of your food. But if you prepare a burnt offering, offer to the Lord. Manoah did not realize it was the angel of the Lord. Then Manoah inquired of the angel of the Lord, What is your name? so that we may honor you when your word comes true. He replied, Why do you ask my name? It's beyond understanding. At the end of our lesson, that's one of the questions. I want you to be thinking about that. Why didn't he tell him his name? Why was the name beyond their comprehension? Well, then Manoah took a young goat together with the grain offering and sacrificed it on a rock to the Lord. And the Lord did an amazing thing while Manoah and his wife watched as the flame blazed up from the altar toward heaven. The angel of the Lord ascended in the flame. Seeing this, Manoah and his wife fell with their faces to the ground. They're scared to death. When the angel of the Lord did not show himself again to Manoah and his wife, Manoah realized that it was the angel of the Lord. And his comment is, we're doomed. <laughs> we're going to die. Okay? So, he prayed, she prayed, the angel returns. But I want you to notice something. The angel repeats the parenting instructions. Okay? But notice what he said in verse 5. Notice what he said in verse 5. I'll go back and read it. You'll become pregnant to the mother, and you're going to have a son whose head is never to be touched by a razor, because the boy is going to be a Nazareth. He'll take the lead in delivering Israel from the hand of the Philistines, Ma uh, not Max Lucado, but Tim Keller says this about verse 5. What was, what was important to the angel was not a list of parenting skills, not a bunch of do's and don'ts that parents and grandparents often do. What was important to the angel of the Lord was the character, the moral character and the moral fiber of this young man. And then Keller says, at school, were there teachers, administrators, who demonstrated moral character? At work, your boss, CEO, manager, superintendent, did they demonstrate moral character? In your family, is it the father, mother, aunt, uncle, an older brother, siblings, who demonstrated that moral character? And Keller said, and I tread softly with this, what about our government? In our government, local, state, and national. Don't we want, Keller said, people, men and women, of high 
moral character? And the answer in the sanctuary is, got some amens, and you folks at home can answer that question too. Again, I, Keller is saying that to the angel, what's important, Manoa and Mrs. Manoa, is not all these rules and regulations. Yeah, he's got to be a Nazarite, but it's his character, his moral character. And when we unpack chapter 14, 15, and 16, just watch how moral character is played out in the life of Samson. Okay? Now, why was he scared? We've seen this angel, we're going to die. In Exodus chapter 33, verse 20. Exodus 33, 20. God is talking to Moses. Here's what he said. Moses, to see me is to die. How would you like to hear that? To see me is to die. So I'll put you in the cleft of the rock, and I will cover you with my hand until I have passed by. When I remove my hand, you will see my back, but you will not see my face. That's why I think Manoah is scared to death. But I want to talk about the wife. So wives, get ready. Husbands, take notes. Okay? Verses 22 to 25. Manoah, I could just hear Barney Five. We're doomed to die! We're doomed to die! We're doomed to die! He said to his wife, We've seen God! We're going to die! But his wife answered, If, if the Lord had meant to kill us, he would not have accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering from our hands, nor shown us all these things or told us what to do. So Laura's going to bring up photo number five. If you're married, do you have a spouse? Somebody in your family. Somebody in your circle of peers or friends. Somebody at work. Somebody in the church. Who can offer wise counsel? And I, I have in my notes here, I don't think at this point in time, when you face that crisis, I don't think you want a Barney Five. He'd be looking for his gun, he'd be looking for his bullet, he'd be looking for Aunt B and Opie. I don't think in a crisis you want Barney Five. I also don't think you want Gomer Pyle. Say the sons of Reyes, say the sons of Reyes. I think you want Sheriff Andy Taylor. Andy was calm, cool, and collected. If you grew up like I did, watching Mayberry RFD and the reruns that go on and on and on. Andy was always calm, cool, and collected. I think that's what Mrs. Manoa was. She was, you might say, the rock in that marriage. I hope, I hope that someplace in your circle of friends, in your family, whatever, you've got Mrs. Manoa. Husband, if we were meant to die, we'd be dead. We're not going to die. I got to give birth. Have you already forgotten what the angel told us? Well, yes, dear. <laughs> yes, okay. So we move on. God performs the impossible. There were four impossible births that I can find in the Bible. The first, Sarah gave birth with Abraham to her son Isaac. And she was like 90 years old, way past the time. Hannah will give birth to Samuel. A really great read is Samuel chapter 1 and Samuel chapter 2. Hannah is married. Her husband's name is Elekanah. He's got two wives. One wife was named Peniah. She's got kids. But his wife Hannah is barren. She's childless, unable to conceive. So she did what any good Jewish woman would do. She goes to Shiloh to the tabernacle. She finds a pew, and she sits down, and she starts praying. Now, when you read Samuel 1 and 2, when she prays, she moves her lips. She's not talking out loud. You know, the tabernacle is sacred. Her lips are moving. And the priest is Eli. And he sees her lips moving. And he thinks, good golly, vote Marie. Look at that woman. She's drunk. I'm going to wait until she's through praying. I'm going to nail her. You don't come into the tabernacle when I'm the priest drunk. So he, he confronts her. 
She said, no, no, no. Haven't had a drink. I was praying to God. I made a vow. I made a vow. We've talked about vows, right? I told God, if he will give me a son, I will turn that son over to him. I'll set him apart. I'll make a covenant. And no razor will touch his hair. I prayed that God would give me a son and I'll turn him into a Nazarite. And so we have an example of the second miracle birth. By the way, Samuel's name, I've asked for a son and God granted. I've asked for a son and God granted. And then, of course, Elizabeth, you know, she's going to give birth to John the Baptist. And then last but not least is Mary. Four miraculous births in the scripture. This is one of those, okay? So he's born. His name is Samson. He grew up. He was blessed by God. And his spirit began to stir him. So we'll go to the conclusion, okay? The woman gave birth to a boy. I'm in verse 24 and named him Samson. He grew and the Lord blessed him and the spirit of the Lord began to stir in him while he was in Manah Dan between Zorah and Estah. He's in that small tribal area of Dan. So what I would like to do is go through a series of questions as we conclude today's lesson. So photo number seven is going to come up. Lifelong vows for Samson. But if you study the Nazarite vow, many of them were short term. A beginning and an end for Thanksgiving, for a, a special event like childbirth, the victory in a battle. Here, Samson is going to be a Nazarite lifelong. Now Paul took a vow. Okay? It's in Acts chapter 18, verse 18. And he took a vow, and we think we know that because as he's getting ready to go to another church city, he shaves his hair. I beg you, yeah, he shaves his hair. He's going to take this vow. So here's my first question. Why does one take a vow? Now this is where I need the audience to shout out an answer and I'll repeat. Why in scripture do we see the use of vows? To show sincerity. Commitment. To be set apart, maybe? Okay. Is it, is, it, is it to be ceremonial set aside to serve God? Have you ever seen that in a church ordination? Just a few months ago, I've lost track of time. Didn't we see Jake ordained? And if you've grown up in the churches of Christ or Christian churches, haven't you seen elders and the pastor ordain another elder and when I was ordained as an elder at Community Christian Church in Frankfurt 10,000 years ago one of the men who laid hands on me was my father-in-law Lawrence Randall who was an elder at New Brunswick Church of Christ in New Brunswick Indiana and that was kind of cool Lawrence also baptized me so that you know those moments um, I still remember. But a church ordination, you set aside that person. They become set aside. They're not special. They're just publicly dedicated that this person has now been set aside to do the following. And then we're all encouraged to do what for that person upon whom we saw the hands laid? We're supposed to pray for them. We're supposed to, we're supposed to be there for them. We're supposed to be like Mrs. Manoa. Not Barney. Mrs. Manoa. Okay? So, next question. What was wrong with grapes? What was wrong with wine? Did it have anything to do with getting drunk? Didn't Eli think that Hannah was drunk? Yeah, it probably had to do with overindulging. Okay? Idol worship in association with prostitution for fertility cults because one of the things they would do is drink a lot of wine and then have sex with these prostitutes before the, the fake alders? Well, let's go on. Photo 9. Is it difficult to be set aside by God to serve him in a secular culture? Think the United States. 
think Carroll County. What do you think? Is it difficult today for you who've been set aside when you came up out of that altar? Is it difficult for you to serve in a society that may poo-poo, downplay, not believe in God, His church? Can be? No? Maybe? We're not there yet? Yes? Yes? Okay? So to be set aside then may have, she said, be different than what it means today. But if people know who you are and what you are by your vocabulary and by your demeanor and by your lifestyle, do they know there's something different about you? One of the things that blew my mind, and I'll just share this because I'm retired from West Georgia. The first year I taught there, 2001, I had this class of 30 students. And in midway through the semester, two of these young girls came up. They were identical twins. And throughout the course of the two years that I worked with them during the student teacher, I could not tell them apart. I wanted to get a stick of note. And here's what they asked me. Now, all I did was just teach. I came in, pulled up the PowerPoint, blah, 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 blah. And then they came up, and here's what they said. Shep. Because I told them, don't call me Dr. Shepherd, just call me Shep. Okay? Shep, yeah. Are you a Christian? Excuse me? Are you a Christian? Well, yeah. Oh, why do you ask? You're the only professor we have that doesn't curse. Are you with me? Now, I might say, phooey or shoot or dog, go on it. But because I didn't curse, they thought I was a Christian. That scared me. Why? People are looking at you, right? People are listening. They're listening to what you say and what you laugh at and what you don't laugh at. And I've got to be honest with you. Sometimes dirty jokes are funny. Ooh. Those of you out there at home, the looks I just got. Now, come on, be honest. Oh, thank you, Stan. Okay. Sometimes dirty jokes. <laughs> Can't, I'm going to move on. I'm off my notes. That's where I get into trouble. I'm sorry, but I, okay. So the angel said, my name is beyond your understanding. What do you think he meant by that? His name was Jeff. He didn't think we had that J sound. <laughs> he didn't think we could, thank you, Richard. He didn't think we, they, we could pronounce the J, or they could pronounce the J. Remember, last week, got in trouble, 42,000, couldn't pronounce shibboleth, shibboleth, and, you know, okay. But what, what, why do you think he said, you wouldn't understand my name if I gave it to you. Is that even important? Or we just move on? He had a special name. He had a special Yeah, he was. If he's an angel, he was set apart. But the other reason was they were looking for a reason, something to worship that they've been told. It was like, it's not important who I am. Yeah, that's a, what you've been told. that's a great point because every... If you take a look at every of the world's religions, all the world's religions' leaders have a name. The Buddha, Siddhartha Gautama, okay? Muhammad, and all the Indian names that, uh, that Dick Engel could tell, he could tell you about. That's a good point. Maybe the angel didn't want to give him their name for two reasons. You wouldn't understand it, and I don't want you worshiping my name. So I'm not going to tell you. Yes, that's true. The message was from God. He was a messenger. That's one of the definitions of an angel, a, a messenger. Okay? So, photo 12. The Spirit of the Lord began to stir in Samson. What does that mean to you? And have you ever felt that stirring? So, when I read the, the Spirit began to stir in Samson as he grew older, what does that mean to you? The Spirit stirred in Samson. Okay, it moved him, it prompted him, it taught him. Have you ever felt the Holy Spirit stir you, move you? Does anybody want to give an example? Well, you felt the Holy Spirit, beyond a shadow of a doubt, was stirring you to do something? Well, when you stir something, it's blended together, so maybe that's what the, I'm trying to say, it's starting to blend in with what is life. 
Okay, and for those of you who have been around the block numerous times, and you've had to make a monumental life decision, did you ever feel the st Spirit stirring you towards a certain open door that you knew beyond a shadow of a doubt, this is the path I'm supposed to follow? And you just knew it in your heart of hearts. You felt the, stir, the Spirit stirring you. Well, so now we end. We end with this. She's going to pull up Ephesians chapter 6, verse 12. And we talked about this very briefly. The two battles that the Israelites faced. Physical battle, combat, spiritual. Ephesians 6, 12. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, authorities, against the powers of the dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. That's Satan's armies. Those are his armies. This battle, like with Samson and the judges before him, is spiritual warfare. And Satan is after two things, your heart and your mind. Now he was defeated in the tomb. Actually, he was defeated on the cross when he defeated death. But when he left the tomb three days later and resurrected, that's when Satan and death were defeated. But he still wages war against believers and the church. Now, if you take a look at Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Colossians chapter 2, verse 15. Paul writes to that church. He says, Satan has been defeated and Satan has been disarmed. He's been defeated and he's been disarmed. That's what Paul wrote to the church in Colossia, which was having problems. Paul says, therefore, he has no control over us. But those of you who have tried to walk the Christian life, he will harass, will he not? He will tempt, will he not? And Tim Keller says, Satan's two greatest weapons in the spiritual battle, battle this is Keller, is fear, which freezes us if you're fearful, you don't move, you don't go forward. So one of the ways that Satan can fight you and me and the church is to plant fear, and the other is deception, to lead you the wrong way. To lead you the wrong way. If you've ever seen the film, 1965, 66, the greatest story ever told, there's a scene several times where the actor playing Satan is dressed in black, and he's always peering behind the corner. He's always peeping behind a tree, looking at Jesus, okay, tempting his followers. He doesn't say too much in the greatest story ever told, but he is there in the shadows tempting. And if Tim Keller is right, that Satan is attacking you and me today with fear and deception, and I'm just going to say this. He can use strife of all kind. Political, economic, racial. He can use the COVID to scare his people. He can use the virus to shut down churches. Fear is one of his best tools. Yes, Christ conquered him. And according to Paul, Satan has been defeated and disarmed. But his army still exists and his army is still fighting you and me. And you know he's alive and well on planet Earth when you're beginning to grow spiritually, when the church is beginning to do great things, that's when he unleashes his army of demons. He's not through. So what do we do as we close? Paul, fill your minds with God's truth, his Bible, and remain on guard with prayer. Fill your mind with scripture. Stay with the fellowship, whether it's online, people at home, texting, whatever technique that you use, or coming to worship face to face. Stay with the crowd. I'm reminded of what Billy Graham used to say. If you've got a fire in the fireplace and you've got six logs, and you take one log out and you put that log over here, eventually what will happen to that one log? 
it'll die, it'll burn out. But those five logs staying together will produce heat. I think what Paul is saying here, fill your minds with God's word, be on guard with prayer, and whatever means, virtual, on-site, stay connected. Father God, thank you for Samson. Um, I don't know why, to be honest with you, Lord, and I just taught the lesson, I don't know why chapter 13 is in Scripture, except maybe to learn about why he was born, something about his mom, something about the Nazarite vow, and something that he was birthed to be the last judge. And will he fulfill his mission? So I guess there's all kinds of really good reasons why Judges 13 is in there. As we get ready to go home, give us safe traveling privileges, keep us safe throughout the week, be with our country, guide our country, our leaders, on both sides of the aisle. On both sides of the aisle, Father. Give us peace and the comfort that we have in you is my prayer in Christ's name. Amen.